So it's a great pleasure to be here again today, and I think we have a lot of really inter interesting information, and hopefully this will set the stage for some of the uh, significance of these large impact basins and their relation to the geology of the moon and the understanding of samples. Not too long ago, actually, uh, 50 years ago next uh, year, it marks the discovery of the Oriental Basin. And this was discovered using um, a rectified things to really understand what was going on. Prior to that time, people like Fursoff saw that there were maria in these deposits, but under favorable librations, photographs were able to be taken and were rectified. <clears throat> and then, essentially, the basin was discovered by a classic paper by Hartman uh, and, and Kuiper and others. And since that time, of course, in pre-Apollo days, in 1967, for Lunar Orbiter 4, data acquired in preparation for Apollo landings, the Oriental Basin was indeed visualized and imaged, and it just was completely changed our thinking about all these basins and so on. So since that time, of course, there was a huge amount of work that was done by a number of really excellent scientists who worked, Bill Hartman, uh, Kuiper, Jack McCauley, Dave Scott, Don Wilhelms, Chuck Wood, Paul Spudis. Paul Spudis actually wrote the book on multi-ring basins, using this as a basis, among other things. Lots of really interesting things. But in the relatively recent past, we've been fortunate to have a Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and a whole set of new data to apply to this problem. And that's what I want to talk about today. First, I'd like to briefly say something about the absolutely incredible LOLA data. It'd be great to turn the lights down if you could a little bit, please. <clears throat> so what do we have here with the LOLA data? There's a huge number of basic and derived data products that you all should be using in these kinds of analyses. They're absolutely fantastic, and I'll try to weave these into the analysis of the Oriental Basin as we go along. Let me just mention them. We have a long flight altimetric profiles. Of, these are great for characterization of topographic features, such as peak ring basins, multi-ring basins, and so on. The quantification of their degradation and modification, the ter determination of geological unit thickness, like lava flows or ejected deposits, et cetera. The determination of stratigraphic relationships. You can use gridded topographic data sets, such as you see here, for flooding experiments, like we talked about yesterday. Uh, surface morphology of typical landforms like we see here, quantitative characterization of classes of landforms, really getting them down and quantifying them and comparing them. And then, of course, the size and shape frequency distribution of populations, such as craters, like we talked about yesterday, where we mapped all the craters larger than 20 kilometers in diameter on the surface of the moon using these kinds of data and looked at their distribution and interpretation. <clears throat> so the other thing you can look at is uh, derived products like detrended topographic data. That's what deep this is. It removes the regional slopes to emphasize short wavelength variations. Very, very effective. You can also look at point-to-point -point slopes at various scale lengths, like you see here. Uh, this will get you surface roughness, concavity, convexity relationships of various terrains and landforms, uh, uh, parameters like Hurst exponents and others that give you an interesting idea about the shape of the topography, if you will. And then an interesting thing here is you can use these data to look at variation in illumination geometry. We're all used to these kinds of images, which are great in and of themselves, but the topography allows you to illuminate things from any angle and any azimuth, and this has huge implications for your ability to, to characterize the landforms and understand them. And finally, of course, LOLA complements and enhances other data sets, as Mike Wargo was uh, addressing yesterday at the end of the session we talked about. So these are all really important things, and I want to try to show you how we've been able to take these data and understand something about the cratering process, particularly using Oriental as a basic parameter and a basic uh, type section, if you will. So you're all aware of the work, pioneering work by Richard Pike, <coughs> who basically looked at crater morphometry and morphology and correlated the two um, and showed the relationship of bowl-shaped craters to, in fact, uh, complex craters, simple to complex relationship. And then, of course, noted that, as one many other workers did as well, as one works up in the depth diameter relationship and the diameter range, you go from essentially Tycho-like peak, central peak craters, to more complex peaks and to peak rings. So peak ring basins, and then ultimately to multi-ring basins. Well, these new data, the LOLA data and other new data, have permitted us to actually <clears throat> look at the characteristics of these features um, as a function of uh, diameter. And in a couple of papers, which I'll only refer to here, um, David Baker and his colleagues uh, have been able to characterize these on both the Moon and Mercury and show the onset diameters uh, and the relationships to complex craters. So he has been able to document on both planetary bodies a major transition from complex craters to uh, peak ring basins through this transition here, and been able to document the relationships here and provide evidence for a changing geometry of the crater cavity as a function of increasing diameters. 
He's also working to <clears throat> um, look at the characteristics of the major ones on the moon, like Antoniati, Compton, and Schrodinger, and actually from uh, crater morphology and morphometry and slope distributions, et cetera, characterize the major um, changes as a function of increasing diameter and to bridge the gap between complex craters and the next landform, which of course is multi-ring basins, where added to these two rings, in fact, is the third ring. And of course, this is the question. What happens up here? We know that the two ring basins seem pretty reasonable as an expansion of central peaks. There's evidence from David and other work that the, the geometry of the cavity is changing. <clears throat> but in fact, what goes on here when this mysterious third ring is indeed added to create multi-ring basins? And of course, this is the question that arose at the acquisition of these data. Any understanding that most of these basins in here at some time or another uh, had clear multi-ring characteristics now modified by volcanic flooding and degradation over time. So this is the basic question, really. And it, and it boils down to, in fact, this tight basin, Oriental, which Paul Spudis and uh, Macaulay and others really looked at in, in excruciating detail and provided very fundamental basis of description so we can actually ask the questions that we'll talk about in just a second. Throughout that period of time, with these workers here, in fact, um, you could see three things were defined. The three rings of the basins, the Cordillera, uh, mountain ring, the outer rook mountain ring, and the inner rook mountain ring, and they had different characteristics. Each one of them was rather unique in its morphology. And then, of course, there were units that were defined in relation to the basin as a whole. The Hevelius formation is generally interpreted to be the basin radial ejecta deposit. The Maunder formation, a cracked and, and smooth terrain in the central part of the basin, is un pretty uniformly interpreted as basin impact melt deposits. And between the two rings of the Cordillera and the Outer Rook, in fact, was the Montes Rook formation, a knobby kind of domical deposit, depending on a scale, uh, that, in fact, is the subject of a lot of controversy. Everybody agrees what it looks like, nobody agrees how it formed, okay? So this is sort of where it was at the time of the advent of Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And Paul Spudis, in his book, has a really great descriptions of, of these controversies and these outstanding questions, and I encourage you to take a look at that because it's an excellent summary uh, of the status of our knowledge. So what are the outstanding questions? What are the nature of the basin deposits? We think we know something about some of them, both in the exterior and interior, but how can we use the new data to characterize them better and understand their origin? What about basin rings? How do we understand the nature and origin and locate this and determine the size of the transient cavity? And once we think we can do that, how do we get to basin event reconstruction, where we get, take the initial shape and talk about the collapse to get it where it is today? Once we know this, we can use these basins as drill holes and then, in fact, um, as I talked about yesterday, understand the relationship of Mari volcanism to these as well. So what I want to do today is focus on these three things and walk through, using the LOLA data, aspects of our understanding, in, at least new hypotheses for the formation of these types of features. So using the uh, LOLA data, we can actually set subdivided quadrants and do average topography throughout this whole quadrant uh, to get the rings that we see here and identify them. So this is each quadrant averaged out in these quadrant segments. And so you can identify the three major rings, the inner rook, the outer rook, and the cordillera. And the question is, which ring corresponds to the transient cavity rim crest? Well, what is the transient cavity rim crest? We know from cratering mechanics that the impact essentially forms a zone of excavation and a zone of lateral displacement. Together, the excavation and lateral displacement creates, in fact, a transient cavity, which, of course, is, like it says, it's a transient cavity. It's constantly changing as a function of the uh, time of, during the abasement event itself. But we can use this to try to understand what's going on, this general concept from cratering mechanics. So <clears throat> we then ask the question, what is, where is the transient cavity rim crest from the initial crater basin formation stage? OK, that would be this thing here, this thing right here. And the question is, which one of these rings correspond to this? OK. Well, we know a lot about how craters work in here, and if we take a look, we can say, see, understand that during this event, the displaced zone pushes material underneath this, and there's a structural component uh, to the uh, upraised rim here, the crater rim. It isn't all ejected. There's a structural component as well. We also know that there's a power law decay of ejecta thickness radially, radially away from the, uh, from the crater basin rim crest. And thirdly, we know that the combined topography um, decays to about less than 10% of the rim crest height uh, within about 1.5 crater radii. So we can take this information from observed craters and also from cratering theory and ask the question then, which basin ring represents the transient cavity rim crest? Which one of these things? We can use these profiles, we can use the topographic maps, and more importantly, we can also use the detrended topography, which takes out the regional slopes and shows the local uh, variation. When we detrend this, remove the regional gradient, we notice a couple of things. There are a large number shown here by arrows 
of pre-oriental impact craters that are visible right up to the Cordillera Ring. This says that the ejecta is of a certain thickness there, but you're seeing a lot, so it has to be relatively thin compared to maybe other areas on the surface. The second thing you see is that when you get to the um, edge of the Cordillera, that the Cordillera Ring topography appears to be too narrow to really represent the transient cavity rim in of itself. So this would make us think, well, maybe, maybe that's not a good candidate for the transient cavity rim crest. What about the Outer Rook Ring, the Outer Rook Mountains here? Uh, well, when we look in there, we actually see some things that have been observed in the geological mapping. You can see here secondary crater chains that extend away. These were noticed immediately on acquisition of the Lunar 4, Orbiter 4 data. But these are able to be used to, in fact, trace these. And you'll see the extension of these into the uh, edge of the outer Rook Mountains here. And this would suggest to us that that's a good candidate for the transient cavity rim crest, because the secondary craters start from there outside the cavity. And in fact, um, this 1.5 rim crest from this also is more consistent with what we think about in terms of the classic uh, impact crater uh, rim. Furthermore, if we look at the Maunder formation, which is normally nominally interpreted to be impact melt by almost all workers, this lies predominantly inside the outer rook rim. So this would say that if this is an impact crater, the melt is largely inside the crater, and the rim is this area between the outer rook and the Cordillera. So summary then, several lines of evidence uh, support the idea that the outer rook ring is the location of the transient cavity rim crest. Well, if that's the case, um, if that indeed does represent the transient cavity rim crest, where's the, what's the origin of the Cordillera mountain ring? That's at outer big mountain ring, okay? Well, we can take a look at the topography once again in terms of profiles and details of uh, gridded data, et cetera, and it really shows some interesting characteristics. The outer rook mountain has a steep inner slope, a shallower outer slope, and the Cordillera mountain has a steep uh, slope as well. And this uh, uh, Montes Rook formation slopes from the outer rook mountain down here, uh, and so the question is, if that's the edge of the transient cavity, what happened here? Well, our hypothesis is that, in fact, in the terminal stages of the event, the structural uplift combined with the incredibly thick ejecta on the edge of the basin caused the rim crest to rotate inward and translate downward as it collapsed into the collapsing transient cavity. Uh, this formed the Listrick fault near the edge of the structural uplift, and the radial ejecta that would have been here, in fact, is deformed as it slumps down the backslope of, uh, to form the Montes Rook formation. Well, if indeed the outer Rook ring is a transient cavity rim crest, what's the origin of the inner Rook ring, this peak ring-like feature in here, different than the outer Rook ring in the Cordillera? Well, here we come back to peak ring basins. And again, the characteristics of these basins strongly suggest that there's variations in there that link them to the kinds of things we see in the smaller basins. So if, in fact, if we take a look here, uh, we can see that the peak ring is very similar to the peak rings that we see in peak ring basins. That's, again, the topography here it amply illustrates that. And so we interpret that to be the next stage, which is actually corresponds at the same time to the collapse of the, the rim of the basin itself. But as the rim is collapsing here, indeed, the basin is uplifting in the center, and the edge of the peak rings is, in fact, uplifting to form the plateau on which the peak ring uh, form themselves, are observed, to see, uh, are observed today. OK. so. We think we know something about the basin deposits based on their previous work and what we see here with the new data. We, we have some ideas about the uh, nature and origin of the basin ring, but how do we get the basin event reconstruction? How do we put these things together to try to understand what's going on? Well, recent events in understanding of cratering theory has helped a lot in this because there's some different ideas that have come up. They're still controversial in many cases, uh, and, and uh, so we need to be thinking about this as not the only option, but a series of papers by Grieve and Santala, in fact, showed based on a whole series of evidence from terrestrial craters, from lunar craters, from theory uh, it's, and experiments, that in fact, small craters had a certain proportion of impact melt to ejecta. Much larger craters had a higher proportion of melt uh, to uh, the ejecta. And that, in fact, there was non-proportionality of energy partitioning, and more energy was going into melting in larger craters than in smaller craters. So how does this all work? Well, this is sort of the nested cavity model in which as you increase the uh, excavation here, actually more and more energy goes into melting, so you produce a nested melt cavity here. This is kind of what I call a watermelon slide. I inadvertently, inadvertently picked the wrong colors here because it's actually pretty hot there. It's not like a cool watermelon. Nonetheless, when you take a look at this, uh, this changes the geometry of the transient cavity. It penetrates deep into the display zone. Central peaks migrate laterally melt samples more deeply than the ejecta, and it forms an inner a strengthless cavity, et cetera. So when we take a look at this then, this is how we would use this information to reconstruct the oriental cavity.
we have something like this, a transient cavity reconstruction with the nested melt cavity here, essentially under thrusting increases crustal thickness here and an annulus around the uh, basin itself. And in the terminal stages of the event, uh, we would interpret this to undergo uh, a, a phase of collapse. Let me give you two steps here. In peak ring basins, we would see this kind of arrangement here. And indeed, this would collapse, and we would see the peak rings fill with melt in this area. In multi-ring basins, the watermelon, if you will, exceeds the depth of the damage zone, of the displaced zone, and therefore forms a strengthless cavity here, which we believe enhances the ability of the whole uh, rim of the, of the cavity to collapse inward into this strengthless uh, basin here and causing uplift such as we see here. So this would be the situation just before cavity collapse as the impact melt cavity, inner cavity, uh, increased in diameter to exceed that. And then, of course, it would collapse uh, in the subsurface and up to form uh, what we see today in terms of the Oriental multi-ring basin. So this is our interpretation. And if we take a look a little further then and ask the question, OK, how do we reconstruct the Oriental event? It would look something like this. This would be the transient cavity. And as the uh, transient cavity began to collapse along the edge of the Cordillera mountain range, uh, the central part was uplifted. And ultimately, we end up with a cross section that we would predict looks something like this in the subsurface. So this is what you see today on the top. This is what we think happened. And these are the steps that we believe, uh, in fact, represent these st stages in the evolution of the basin. Now, this has implications for crustal thickness and gravity. And of course, these can be beautifully tested uh, with the upcoming GRAIL mission. For example, we would predict an anomalously thick crust here. This could be what the negative annulus might be, anomalously thin. This could be positive, a super isostatic situation caused by, in fact, the significant uplift of the basin in the terminal phases. And this is testable. So we're looking at testing the model in a variety of different ways here. Uh, GRAIL gravity data, as well as volumetric comparisons. Now, it's really interesting, the LOLA data permits us to actually do uh, analyses where we can look at the thickness distribution of the ejecta of the Oriental Basin. We want to know how much came out of the basin because we have to put it back in to test ideas about its formation. Well, again, using this information here, we're able to actually go back, measure all the craters around Oriental, and actually look at the distribution as a function of radial range. When we do that, we see right at the basin edge that large craters are missing. And as you get out to about 500 kilometers radius from the rim crest, you get back to a normal distribution of craters. Okay, So when we do that, we can actually take this information and turn it into a thickness, ejecta thickness decay map, such as you see here, which is an isopac map of ejecta thickness. And then, of course, we can measure the thickness decay law. We can translate that into uh, the Cordillera ring and into the outer rook ring. We can also measure the volume of that. There's an implied volume here, as well as the thickness decay law. So these are the kinds of things we're working on today to compare to the inner uh, volumes. And this data, these data are just absolutely incredible. So we're, you, know, you can do really quantitative things, like, in fact, um, take a, a, a line within 5% of the outer rook uh, rim buffer, for example, and then essentially just quantitatively assess the volume. Okay? And you get great data, which is really uh, reproducible and, and you know, extremely reproducible. And what we can see here is that we can get a series of estimates here at what the volumes are as a function of which ring you're looking at. And this, in fact, can be taken all the way out to the Cordillera Ring. So we have these data now, and we're in the process of comparing the inner volumes with the outer volumes to try to match them up and understand what might be going on in terms of the steps from the cavity itself, the ejecta, the collapse. And then we'll be able to and beautifully compare, we hope, to the GRAIL gravity data, which will enable us to balance all these things and really understand what's going on here uh, in the interior. Okay? So this is where we are at the present time. I'll just close by pointing out basin as drill holes. Carly Peter discussed this briefly yesterday. Uh, we know that the structure of the crust, the mega regolith, upper North Pacific crust, and the lower Noritic crust, and this is a very much of a generalization from the new views. But in fact, Carly showed yesterday how much information there is in Oriental. And we have a paper that's uh, in preparation, which will describe a lot of this uh, with the, with the da new data uh, from M cubed. But the bottom line is the basin sample largely mega regolith and mostly the upper part of the North Pacific crust. But there's one crater here, Maunder Crater, which in fact it postdates the basin. It's in the inside of the basin at the edge. And that in fact has a rather noritic uh, interior that shows that thick lower crust, we believe, uh, remains below uh, essentially uh, the inner basin floor. So it looks like the basin penetrated in. Carly described the uh, the peak ring basin, the peak rings consisting of shocked anorthosite and um, and crystalline anorthosite. 
And so basically that's what we think is going on, and we'll be able to compare this based on this as another part of the constraints on the cavity reconstruction. Mike Orgo asked yesterday, what would I need more to get better information about the surface of the moon? And I want to point out in closing that this is, in fact, the place to go with humans, okay? If you take a look at future exploration, what do we, what do we know? Well, if you look at Oriental, you can actually take the landing sites. Uh, one of my, my first job was actually working in site selection. We tried to understand impact bases back then. And um, in fact, Apollo 15 was sent to what we think is morphologically the edge of the Cordillera ring for Imbrium. Apollo 17 was chosen because it was essentially at the outer rook ring equivalent of the Serenitatis Basin. And if you look here, the Apollo and Luna landing sites can actually be placed in the context of the Oriental Basin. And look what we got at those, at those sites. I mean, we learned a huge amount about basins. Now we need to take the capability represented by human exploration, incredible capability as shown by all the samples that were brought back, and indeed uh, go and sample these things in such a way that we can actually now resolve the mystery, 50-year-old mystery of the Oriental Basin. Thank you very much. Questions for Jim. Paul, go ahead. And Jim, can you repeat the question? Sure. Uh, Jim, that's really nice. Okay. Uh, so, we're continuing to really lean, but great insights into the history of the Morning Top. Uh, uh, yeah, Paul Warren, UCLA. Yeah, sure. First was a compliment. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> right. Uh, now, uh, you mentioned that historically the Maunder formation has been interpreted as impact melt. So, I'm wondering. Um, you know, it, it's, it's perched there on a shelf around the basin. So have you thought about uh, why it didn't go down into the interior, if yes, it so is impact melt? The question is, the Maunder Formation interpreted as impact melt, why is, why, does it, why is there topography in the inner basin? And the answer, uh, at least uh, partly, has to do with the fact that uh, we actually see it inside the inner part of the basin. It's all cracked and modified. It's a smoother plain species, but it's absolutely there. The Mario Rantal, the Mario deposits don't cover it all up. Our thinking is twofold. First of all, you get thermal stresses associated with a peak heating below the basin as well as the uplift of geotherms that over the short period of time, millions to maybe tens of millions of years, you're actually getting thermal contraction preferentially in the middle of the basin. Okay. Second thing is the melt column itself is cooling. So we're, we're trying to estimate based on the topography, there's an abstract by myself and Lionel Wilson in the last LPSC where we try to look at the, use the actually the topography to understand how thick the impact melt might be, because it's going to undergo as a silicate melt something of the order of 10% contraction from thermal, just from cooling. So it looks to us like there's a combination of those two factors that are leading to um, the topography that we observe today. But the melt is definitely on the floor as well. Other questions? We got time. We do. We do. You talk quick. No other questions. You've got to be kidding me. Uh, right here. Who's been drinking decaf out there? Come on. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I, I hear a lot of, of, of the work about the impact basins and what you're learning from that, and it's all fascinating. But what I'm missing or I'm not hearing is what this tells you about the impact or. Do you know about, it, the, about the whatever hit that oh, created oh, the, the very war. first one? Sorry, yes. So I was waiting impact I, or something. So am I just <laughs> missing that? Or <laughs> well, yeah. indeed, um, many of you are fully aware of the, of the early work by, uh, by Bill Anders. There's a, by Ed Anders. Bill Anders was an Apollo 8 astronaut, didn't get to the surface to pick up rocks. Ed Anders uh, analyzed um, essentially uh, a variety of elements, essentially uh, elements related to meteoritic uh, sources like platinum group elements and things like that, where uh, they were able to try to assess the um, impactor population. And the answer is, if we were able to, and, and they made up some predictions and calculations, and somebody other than I can probably give a better update on what the status of that is now. There were several classes that were defined. If we go with Ori there to Oriental, like I was pointing out at the end, that would be a beautiful way to be sure we were able to assess that. And in indeed, you know, Oriental is the youngest large basin, so we would want to know what those impactors were because maybe there's a changing population. We see a lot of data uh, from Bill Bodke and our work on the science paper and Bob Strom that suggests two populations of impactors early on. And, you know, this is something we should turn our attention to uh, as part of our NLSI efforts as well as, as just human exploration and, and sample return uh, to address. It's a really good question. 
All right, thanks very much, Jim. It's time to move on. Uh, we do have to do an instantaneous.